Welcome to the Scoop Order. Happy Friday to all of you guys. I hope you guys had a great March Madness Friday. Uh, we have some rising stars of spring ball. They've got a big scrimmage tomorrow. They're going to get after a little bit. We're going to get into all of that. Uh, as always, we appreciate you guys. Thank you guys so much for uh, the growth of this channel. 30,000 and climbing. This is the last day of the merchandise drop. Go to repthescoop.com. Uh, we have a few hours left. Uh, and after that, it is going to be closed for... Uh, the foreseeable future, we'll probably have another one maybe around August or so, but if you want your scoop gear to wear to our tailgate party on August 13th, please go to repthescoop.com. Uh, the store is closing up tonight, and we can't open it back up, so once it's closed, it's closed, so we appreciate you guys as always. If you guys enjoy this content, please leave us a like, click subscribe, also click that little alert bell. Uh, again, we appreciate all of the support. It's been fantastic. Shout out where you guys are watching from. Shout out who you guys are watching with and shout out what your weekend plans are. What did you guys do for March Madness? What do you guys plan on doing Saturday, Sunday? This is one of the best weekends of the year for watching sports because it is literally all day, every day, and all night. So there's some really good uh, basketball, some good upsets. So we're going to get into all that as always. But Nevada, the real March Madness is for us is going inside the Woody Hayes right now. Spring football is going on. A lot of big matchups. A lot of guys trying to step up in one spots. Uh, and with some uh, some burn inside the rotation, Nevada, as we talk about Ohio State football, who are some guys that have stepped up in your eyes over the last couple of weeks? We've had four practices thus far. Uh, there's a scrimmage slash practice tomorrow on Saturday. Uh, but what have your thoughts been through four uh, practices during the spring? Well, from talking to people, you know, I mean, one of the the – Obviously, the key battles that everybody's been kind of wondering about all spring long and be long before the spring, we talked about the offensive line and kind of where we're going to shake out on the offensive line, who's going to be the guys that are going to step up and what they're going to do. And to me, it seems pretty clear from talking to people at the Woody that Josh Fryer is going to slide inside, move from that tackle position, play guard, and they really like Luke Montgomery out there at right tackle. And, you know, you've been saying for a long time that, that you know, one of the things about Luke is light on his feet, great in his pass sets, you know, maybe not as stout as you'd like on the on the inside, you know, as, as stout as you want on an interior lineman. But at tackle, you know, you can kind of play that dancing bear position right there and really kind of go out there and do a nice job. And I think they're really – they're pleased with that. And I think that, you know, when you start hearing – about the line combinations, you start hearing more and more about line combinations that include Fryer at guard and Montgomery at tackle. And so to me, that's really a, a pretty big tell. And one of the really early stories of, of spring football has been kind of the emergence of Luke Montgomery at right tackle and, you know, the, the I wouldn't say departure, but the changing of position of Josh Fryer to guard. And, and uh, again, I think it's, it's hardly settled. I think there's a lot of football to be played. But they really like that. Now, when, now, once it really starts hitting, they really start kind of getting into it, we'll know a little bit more. But the guys I talk to seem to think that's the way that it's going. You know, that you've got Zen in the mix. You've got George in the mix. You've got, you know, Tigra in the mix. Um, I mean, there's a lot of guys out there that are bodies. But, you know, Josh there at guard, Luke at tackle, that seems to me to be one of the early stories of the spring. The second one, Another one of your favorites is Carson Hinsman at center. Carson Hinsman's been a guy that's really ha he had a, a great winter. We talked about it all winter in terms of you know how good he was during the winter, how good he was in winter workouts, how they kind of put him up against Seth McLaughlin and in some kind of one on one type of situations, and he kept testing out better. And he'd, he'd win the reps, he'd do the little things, and doesn't mean a lot. Only four practices in, but he's figured the snapping thing out, and. He's really looking good out there uh, as the you know, potential starting center is the number one. We're going to need them all in a long, grueling you know schedule like this. But you know Carson Hinsman at center has been you know probably my second big story of the spring, and the, the third one is kind of that linebacker battle. You know where they've been playing three linebacker looks a lot this spring. Now I don't know if they're planning on doing that more. They're just a way to try to get the, you know both guys on the field. But I've got it handicap right now. I've got C.J. Hicks slightly up, uh, in front of Sonny Styles right now for that second linebacker spot with Gabe Powers closing like a banshee. So uh, you know you've got three guys in the mix there with Sonny and C.J. and and, and Gabe. 
you know, you know all in, to flank Cody in, in one way, shape, or form. But I've got C.J. Hicks kind of leading that, you know, by the slightest of, of, uh, of margins right now. I think he's doing a better job of kind of read and react. Um, you know, Sonny just seems to be a, a better a seek and destroy type of guy, a guy that, you know, when they've got him with his hand on the ground, when they've got him in run blitzing situations, he's you know, particularly dynamic, but a, just a little slow on the reads right now. And that's can that something that, that comes over the next 30 practices between spring and fall? Of course. But I've got C.J. Hicks just so slightly ahead in that horse race. Um, and so that's my third big story of, of the spring, but you know, lots of great spring you know, football to be played. Uh, the team's in tremendous shape, knock on wood. We've been able to avoid injury, which, you know, always, you know, I, I, I hate even talking about that, but I would talk it out of existence. So, so far so good. And uh, just you know, a really, really probably the most exciting spring ball. Usually spring ball to me, honestly, is kind of who cares uh, you know, it's exciting sometimes to see it, but like you're not really seeing this. Uh, here you have some real stories. You've got some real stories being played out, a, a brand new offense being implemented as well. So lots to like this spring and, and lots to be excited about. I think a huge question is can Sonny South play linebacker? And that's something people don't want to talk about because Sonny's a five star guy. He graduated early, he looks the part, but can he really read and react and play linebacker at the college level? Because again, I've seen guys that were very talented, very uh, highly rated. Again, Curtis Grant comes to mind. Curtis Grant is a great kid. But when he showed up to Ohio State, he was terrible at linebacker. And this is a kid, if you watch his highlight tape, he looked like Ray Lewis. Like I mean, I thought, I literally thought he was going to step in. He had the uh, kind of the, the notion of like the Mike D'Andrea, you know, and it all came from Andy Castamore. Andy Castamore was the guy that spawned this idea where a guy could be an 18 year old step into college football and just be the best linebacker in the entire nation as an 18 year old, which is what Andy was. So, you know, when Mike DeAndre showed up, that's what they expected from him. Obviously he didn't deliver that. And then with Curtis Grant, Curtis Grant, again, I've said this a million times, was the second player in the entire country by rivals. Only guy above him was Clowney. Jadavian Clowney is the best, college player or excuse me the best high school player i've ever seen uh, on tape and again if you guys want some fun go look at his highlight tape from when he was at rock hill um in south carolina and he was he looked like an nfl defensive end like javon curse uh as a 17 year old and he got to college obviously he went three and out and he went one overall and again like that's like that's as good of a prognostication as you can if a kid is so good on high school film that he can go to college and not go to Bama, not go to Florida, not go to Ohio State. He went to South Carolina and he maintained that level of efficiency. And he still went first overall in the draft after going to South Carolina. That's when you know a guy is just an absolute different level guy, like a, a, a once in a generation type talent. And Curtis Grant was right behind him, but Curtis showed up and he couldn't read keys. He reacted slow. Very, very nice kid, but not a great college linebacker didn't get drafted did, had a nice role in winning the national title, but like, you know, Sonny, I don't think Sonny's all the way down that road yet because again, he's only been playing linebacker for four practices. He never played linebacker in high school. So it's brand new to him, but at linebacker, man, everything is right in front of you and you have to be able to decipher what's going on, pick through the trash, project where the running back's going to be make plays, uh, get your drops. And it's all new for Sonny. And Sonny obviously played safety in high school. He played safety last year for us. But this will be very interesting. Like, does CJ Hicks have an advantage? I mean, if you put a gun to my head and say, Kirk, who's going to start at linebacker week one? CJ Hicks. Might be, he played linebacker all through high school, played linebacker the la uh, last year, last two years. Um, he feels to me like he's going to be our starting role linebacker. Again, it's exceptionally early. Obviously, Sonny's just learning the position, but I think you know CJ is uh he's different. You know, I think that he's a guy who's a five another five star guy, a really good athlete. But I think he uh he's got an edge on Sonny right now just because of the the familiarity with the position. Uh as for Josh Fryer, you know, he's the classic example of do you want to do what's best for the team or what's best for Josh Fryer? Where do you put him out at right tackle and have him be really fluid and aggressive and strong pass protector? 
Or do you put him at right guard where he is going to play in the National Football League? And again, Josh Fryer in 2021 in the first day of spring, or excuse me, fall camp with Greg Studewire as the line coach was our starting left guard. So that's how good Josh Fryer was years ago. Now, mind you, 2021 sounds like it's a thousand years ago because you have 21, 22, 23. We're up to 24 now. And now Josh is moving back into guard. But um, that's how good he was as a redshirt freshman. They wanted him to play. Uh, early and often, and he was a physical kid and a big kid, and now he uh, he's in that same situation. But he talked to Ryan Day, and he said, hey, I'm going to be an NFL guard. I'd appreciate if I could play a little bit of guard this year, and they're trying to facilitate that. But we need one of these young guys to step up and pass block a right tackle. So I think it's going to be a, a fantastic competition between Luke Montgomery, George Fitzpatrick, Tigre Shishabola, um, and if they hit a guy in the portal. So uh, And if not, put – you know, Josh Fryer back out at right tackle, let him pass pro as much as he can. Because uh, if if our left and right tackle can pass pro the way I think they can, we win the national championship. So uh, it'll be very exciting uh, to keep that going. Nevada, is there any uh, any disagreement with any of the uh, the things I laid out uh, going forward in spring football? No, no, I think and I think you're right on it. And you know, I look, I think this Ohio State team's got very few question marks and. I, you know, I, I, what I'm looking for is will Ohio State, you know, we know Ohio State's going to lose guys in the second transfer window. And I, I'm not, that is not inside information. That is just prognostication. That's just, hey, it's inevitable with a roster like this, given the, uh, the reality of the transfer portal in 2024 and, and, we're, and we're kids right that we'll lose kids. Um, I haven't heard that we're going to lose, I, I haven't heard any names, to be honest with you, that we're going to be losing. I wouldn't imagine we'd lose anybody of consequence. And when I mean by consequence, I'm talking about somebody who's going to be a contributor to the 2024 national championship drive. Um, I think guys that are, that are buried on the depth chart or a little bit, you know, down or a little bit disenchanted, a little bit passed by those could be moved. But when I'm looking at what positions could Ohio state still be a buyer at? Um, I mean, maybe left tackle, may, maybe left tackle. I don't know. It, it would have to be a stud, but I think the, the, Two positions where they could be a buyer at would be tight end and place kicker. And I, I know the place kicker sounds crazy because you know nobody cares about the place kicking and we got fielding coming back. But um, you know, man, if you if you could get a dependable kicker, some guy that's a stud, yeah, you know, I would absolutely be portal shopping for a kicker and tight end. You know, we've talked about this. You know, we've been, we've kind of been on this. We're kind of sounding the alarm on this. Our tight end you know, group is not, I mean, just not where it needs to be. And I know that they try to address that with Will Kaczmarek. I'm not sure he's going to be the answer. You know, Jelani Thurman's got all the ability in the world, but, you know, that's a room where if you could find an established tight end, if you could find a guy that's a difference maker, a guy that's, yeah, I can't miss guy, you know, I'm Ohio State, I'm going and getting them. And, and I, it would be hard for me to believe with 127 other schools or 130 schools, whatever it is, they're out there that there's not a tight end that wouldn't want to play in Ohio State's offense, or that wouldn't want to play with this 2024 Ohio State team and, and compete for a national championship. But if I'm Ohio State, I'm I'm portal shopping for a tight end and a kicker. And I think if you did that, then this is pretty close to a uh, pretty close to a perfect team. Yeah, I agree. I think that tight end is a it's a red alarm at this point. I mean, the fact that we've got G Scott, um, who's like a C level tight end, C D level tight end. He's not. He's not a draft pick. He's going to be undrafted free agent running around next year at Pro Day. But I think when you can get Jelani going, uh, you've got a guy that could be a draft pick, a third, second, and third round pick type guy. Uh, but you need the coach to develop him. You know, the coach can't be getting beat down in, uh, by the strength coach. He can't be getting punked. Uh, he's actually going to be like a, a real coach and go develop these guys. Because again, at some point, like you can't just be a homie. You can't just be the cool recruiting intern dude. You have, you have to actually go be a coach. So, like, for Jelani Thurman, like, he needs he needs discipline. He needs authority. And, again, that's the problem with, like, some of these young coaches is that when you're a homie, you can't ever develop guys because they don't trust you. It just is what it is. And, again, you might think you're doing the right thing by being their buddy and their friend. But, you know, as you get deeper into it, you know, you, you got to – there's got to be a line there between being a player and a coach. And I think that's what Keenan's screwing up. And – Jelani should be our starting tight end. He started the the bowl game. 
Uh, but then he only played like four or five plays. So there's a big uh, discrepancy between being a starter and actually being like a contributor to the game. But with Jelani, I mean, he needs to be developed in a hardcore way. And again, he's he's as talented as I've ever seen at Ohio State over the last, at least over the last 20 years. Not not Ricky Dudley, who went first round, but he's he's right there. I mean, he's as talented as Jeremy Ruckert and Jeff Hireman and Nick Vanette and some of these other guys. But you got to develop them, man. I mean, you got to have a really hardcore plan for these guys, really get after them. And that was the good thing about Urban is that regardless of who the head coach was, he was going to develop guys that had talents. Now, he's not going to waste his, his time on guys that, frankly, were, were misses in recruiting. But a guy like Jelani should be like an all-Big Ten candidate this year. But he's not even a starter right now because he's not being developed. So I agree with you on the tight end thing. The kicker thing is like it's one of the weirdest things in the world because you'd think if you're a fantastic kicker, you'd want to come to Ohio State. But I don't see that as often as uh, as I'd like. I would think that with as explosive as our offense is and – how many PATs will be kicking and how many points he could potentially score. You'd want to come to Ohio State, but our kicking game has sucked over the last five years. Like our kickers haven't been NF again, and it's not that they're bad kids. Again, like, you know, uh the kid that missed the Georgia field goal, he's not a bad kid, but we need NFL kickers. And we haven't had an NFL kicker since Nuge, um, the guy that was drafted. Uh, Aaron Petri was a a draft or a late round undrafted guy, um, but we haven't had any guys that have been like to the level that we need them to be at. And I see kickers get drafted from much smaller schools, much smaller programs. And uh, why can't we take those kids and make those all Americans at Ohio State? I don't know, but that's something I think we need to dig into more with the transfer portal. Uh, Nevada, we get some super chats. Let's go through a few of these. <laughs> here we go nevada uh we got a do this from chris blunt do i have to rsvp for the spring game party uh chris you do not um i just like to have kind of a basic head count so if you put it in the comments or on buckeyescoop.com or just email me barton.145 at gmail.com i will kind of i just want to have like a rough count of who's showing up because i think we're gonna have a massive crowd but I want to make sure that you guys are uh, taken care of and I can introduce myself to everybody and you guys have a great time. So, you know, it's it's one thing to have an event. It's another thing for the event to be a raging success, which ours will be. Um, but we just want to make sure we lay the groundwork to make sure that it's really a, a good time for everybody. Um, I'll be there. My wife will be there. I will have some special guests there. Um, I've invited a ton of people. So whoever shows up will have a great time. But I'm looking forward to meeting you, Chris. Uh, Nevada, eventually you'll get here for one of these meetups, correct? Oh yeah. No, I, I, like I said, I wish I could be there for that one. Won't be there for that one. We'll be there for the next one. Uh, if, if maybe that's one's before, the before the season or, you know, into the fall when we do the grand opening. But, um, no, like if you're going to the spring game, no excuse for not going to the, the B-dubs thing. You're going to be down there anyway. So just move your tailgate to the B-dubs and, You'll have a good time. It'll be fun. And I, I had somebody, they texted me and they said, in Nevada, I'm going to try to make it by. And I'm like, hey, Yoda said, there is no try. Only do or do not. And there is no try. So make sure you guys do and uh, show up to the thing. It'll be a, a lot of fun. Mr. Barton's going to be there and holding it down. And uh, I guarantee everybody's going to have a good time. And if you wear your gear, you might get a free beer. You wear that gear, Nevada is buying you a free beer. So... Make sure that Nevada is paying for a lot of beers. So uh, the gear drop, uh, repthescoop.com, is closing in hours. So it's your final reminder. If you guys aren't part of the live broadcast, uh, sorry for you. But uh, we've we, we've sold a ton of gear. So thank all of you. All of the proceeds are going to pay it forward uh, per usual. Clay Alders, Mountain Geely. Appreciate you, my man. Thanks for being Scoop Alter. Thanks for the five. Thanks again for the plug on Knife Magazine. Appreciate you, as always, my friend. No question, just paying it forward. Have a great weekend, everyone. Yeah, support. Again, this is the best part about what we do with our community on BuckeyeScoop.com, on our BuckeyeScoop YouTube channel, is if you have a business, we will plug it for you. Holler at us. We'll take care of you. Uh, Clay writes for um, a very nice knife publication, and we uh, we, we promoted uh, one of our Scoop members who he covered. 
So again, if you guys have something, send me an email and we will get through all of that. DJ Double B, thank you for the five. Nevada, do you think 07 Kurt Burke Carton, excuse me, would have given up a TFL to Gene Smith's backup at Notre Dame? God bless. Oh, is, is this what a what a right. great question? What a I, great question. I, I my this wife is, was bringing home my wife was bringing home graders, which is why we were ten minutes late because I was like, I'm not going to do the stupid podcast unless I can have my graders milkshake that my wife brought me. Oreo cookies oh, and whole milk, delicious. So I had to delay the podcast so I could savor my milkshake. And then I wake up to this, this blasphemy, this insanity. Nevada, do you think that 07 Kirk Burke Carton, first team All American Burke Carton, Tree in the Grove Burke Carton, would have given up a tackle for loss to Eugene Smith's backup at Notre Dame? Uh, Nevada, go ahead and give me your uh, projection on that. Yeah, I, I, I think that, that Rudy would have given you that little shake, kind of that fake outside move, and then went across your face on the inside, beat you to the inside, and, uh, and sacked Todd Beckman. I think that that would have happened. And uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but Gene Smith was the player who went off the field when Rudy Rudiger went out there during the, the famous Rudy play. I didn't know if you know that or not. I mean, are you being serious right now with Rudy? <laughs> little slow white dude, little that, li- little, that, little slow white dude at the end of the fourth quarter of some blowout game. Is that is this real? That that literally happened. That little Rudy Rudiger made a sack on his only play. He would have he, Rudy Sean Aston got a sack in that game. So Rudy certainly would have done it, and he would have certainly. How many sacks did they give up that game? Like seventy. Yeah, I think they gave up a lot. I think there was a lot. Of, you, there were a lot of sacks. I, there were a lot of. Sacks. I mean, if Gene was playing D end. With his fat, dumpy body. Oh, my God. You want to talk about the killing fields? You want to talk about dump truck? I mean, he would have been, he would have been out in the landfill if I'd have gotten a hold of him. But, I mean, if Rudy, <laughs> a walk-on white dude who's, like, short and fat and slow, if I get to block that dude, I mean, I mean, I, I blocked the walk-on in the spring game, and I choked him out. I'll never forget. I choked this kid out named Brett Daly. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. He was a nice kid. Married a really nice girl who I've known since my freshman year, uh, Mary Rita Daly. Mary, I'm sorry, but I don't have to do this. So Brett was a nice kid, but he was a tryhard and kind of a douchebag. And he ran past me during a walkthrough period during practice. And Jim Bowman destroyed me in front of the whole team. And I was like, I told Brett, I was like, if you want to run past me in a walkthrough, I'm going to kill you when we actually play a real game. And this was like literally a week later we played the spring game. And I double hand choked him in, in the middle of the play. In the middle of the play, I put both my hands around his throat and choked him. And he couldn't do anything because he was too small. Because he just wasn't he wasn't as strong as I was. I was way stronger than he was. And he had no choice. And then I just destroyed him in front of everybody. His parents, God, Jesus, and everybody. Because he wanted to be hard in a walkthrough. And I was like, you know... I'm like, I'm that dude, but in a walkthrough, I'm not that dude. In a walkthrough, I'm chilling, but in a game, I'm not chilling. And in a game, it's like the real thing. But this dude wanted to be hard in a walkthrough, run around me, make me look stupid in front of the offensive coordinator, make me get ripped. And I was like, all right, that's fine. We, we play a real game. You know, okay, we're going we're gonna to see who's the real one. And I, I choked him out, and he couldn't do anything about it. And it was like, I was like, see, like I don't want to embarrass you in front of your parents, but if you don't act like a douchebag – then it is what it is. It's, it's all real. Because again, like I, I don't like when a guy's a walk, like when I'm way better than somebody at everything, I don't want to do that to a guy. But if you want to act like a douchebag and think that you're on my level, then I'm going to do that to you. I mean, he's my age and he has a walk on, He but he wasn't strong. You know? And it's like, I'm, I'm way stronger than you are. And so when we actually played a real game, then I was like, okay, well, you want, you want to do that kind of trash? Let's go. And again, I, I just like, you know, I, I treated him like he was a new guy in prison, which is fine. Because you want to do that kind of stuff, man. We don't play. So, uh, But I think that if I had to play Gene, he he would have never been the athletic director against us because he would have been in the ground. If I had to play against Rudy, he had never been selling barbecue sauce and doing speeches. He had been in the ground too. So, again, like it probably would have been better for Ohio State because we would have had a real AD. We would have got a new football building. It would have been lit. But instead uh, – he didn't get to see me. I mean, they're playing right the Rice Owls or Georgia Tech or whoever Rudy played, and you know, so they got to get the backups in. But against Ohio State, man, 
Uh, we ought to, we ought to put him in the dirt and the mud pretty good. Thomas Taylor, thank you for the five. Uh, I appreciate you, brother. I can't wait to see you, your wife, and Andy Joe on April 13th. With March Madness here, what would be Nevada Bucks Sportsbook to hang out all day of choice? Ooh, that is a great question because I assume that sportsbook is not like the Cleveland, Ohio DraftKings book or the Columbus FanDuel book. I'm thinking... That is somewhere in a wonderful desert metropolis known as Las Vegas, Nevada. If you could book a uh, a scoop party that only you were allowed to attend and none of your friends and nobody else could attend, where would it be at? Because uh, it's not going to be at Red Robin drinking an Oreo uh, strawberry milkshake. Where would you go if you could book your March Madness party, uh, say, next year? Yeah, no, I'd go to Circa, Circa Sportsbook. Uh, if you guys haven't been to Circa in Vegas, you know, the location isn't great because it's kind of old, old time Vegas, but the sportsbook there is great. And it's also the sharpest sportsbook in all of it. They got the sharpest lines, the best bookmakers, and uh, the best odds makers for sure. Um, and just a great setup. So, Circa Sportsbook, that, if you're in Vegas, definitely uh, worth going to. Is that where Stadium Swim is? Yes. Would you be at Stadium Sport? Would you be indoors, like so you don't get your skin be, like too burnt? I I'd be in I'd be indoors because I'm I'm all about business that day, man. It ain't, it ain't about being by the pool. It's all about business that day. <laughs> there's 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 no business to be done by the pool, correct? No, that is correct. Well, there's monkey business, but we're not talking about <laughs> monkey business. <bro. laughs> There's no business to be done by the poll. All right, I'm gonna. Uh, that'll be on my uh, forum. I'm gonna go to the beat ups on the 13th. And say no business uh, is allowed at the poll. No, no vodka. No, no vodka tonics. No, we're about our business. No monkey business. <laughs> Dev Sobel, thanks for your super ultra. Thanks for the five. Saw Jakeem Stewart today on video. Defensive lineman, incredible, so agile. He's on the radar for the Bucks. He's the number one player in the country for his class. And, uh, you know, we just gave Larry a two-year deal. So, hey, we're trying to do everything we can to get stay in the, stay in the mix with these guys. But, you know, I, I he's a guy that would be an instant starter, freak of nature. Um, let's see if I have his film. Nevada, Jakeem Stewart is one of those guys. I mean, it's funny because I'd be like, God, who's the last guy we, that I could say that we got was like Jakeem Stewart, Edric Houston, who we just got literally this year. But I, uh, I'll throw some Jakeem up for you, Deb, so we can talk through Jakeem. But he is a bad, bad boy. Uh, and he also has a Thanos AI mock where but Jakeem is, I mean, he looks like like a 29-year-old going against, you know, playing seventh grade football. Uh, he's nasty. Again, here you see him tackling uh, the quarterback and the running back and jackknife powerbombing the guy. You see him blocking um, a tan version of Mark Pantone, picking a, a linebacker like a little kid. And Nevada, your thoughts on Jakeem Stewart? Because uh, I think we're in the mix for this kid. I think we're in the mix for every kid just because of how we're developing guys for the league. Uh, but this kid is a, a monstrous difference maker. Uh, but your thoughts on Jakeem Stewart? Yeah, look, I mean, obviously, high demand player. Um, everybody's in. Everybody seems like they have a chance to you know, to be on them. Everybody wants a piece of them, but you know, with Larry Johnson, you never bet against him because he's been pulling guys for years and years and years. And just when everybody starts thinking that he loses his fastball, he goes out and gets Edric Houston. And uh, I mean, Edric Houston's tape last year. You know, we've watched that, but his defensive tape was as impressive as anybody's. Uh, in high school football last year, he was he was that good, that much of a difference maker. Um, you know, when you're talking about him and Jakeem Stewart, it's just it's various degrees of of great because they they all look great, they all make high impact plays. But you know, I mean, Ohio State feels like they're they're in it to win it with him, and we'll see, we'll see how if uh, the interest is reciprocal, we'll see how much of an NIL kid he is because uh, yeah, at the end of the day, Ohio State can play the NIL game, but they don't like to play the NIL game. They they like to get those kids and then get them satisfactory NIL deals. They don't want it to be just about NIL. And um, I think that's been a strategy. They've been, you know, they've been pretty good at executing. We'll see how it works with Jakeem. 
Yeah, and traditionally, like we we aren't great with getting these kind of kids. I mean, you know, he's he's a different cat. He's a monster, but he's uh, I don't know. When you want to go down into Nolans, which is where he's from, it's uh. It gets a little hairy sometimes. I mean, if this kid does not end up at LSU, I'd be shocked just because, you know, like when we played Louisiana, uh, LSU, you know, in, in 07, their entire front was from Louisiana. Like they don't have to go very far to find giant, fast defensive tackles, defensive ends. Um, so there was a point in time at Ohio State where we didn't even recruit Louisiana because it's pointless. I mean, we went after Tacky Curtis because – of the uncle, who's a really solid dude who I got to know really well, Jess Curtis. But that was kind of a, a fool's errand. He went to SC, and I was at Wisconsin. But this is a kid, you know, when you see a superstar defensive lineman and he's from New Orleans and he's from a parochial school, generally it, they have like a supersonic uh, monorail like you're at the Grand Floridian in Disney World to take him straight to LSU. So... If we get this kid, it'd be amazing. Georgia is a little different, especially Buford, where we got uh, um, Edric Houston from. But when you're talking about a kid from Louisiana, I think the only kid from Louisiana we've ever gotten was Nader Abdallah, who, of course, wasn't really that great. I mean, of all the Louisiana D tackles we get, we probably got the worst one in history uh, for being a Power 5 guy. But this kid would be a monstrous kid. But... You never know. I mean, Brian Kelly could get hired by uh, the New York Jets next year or some craziness. So you just got to stay on a guy like this. But he is a monster. And, you know, as much as people don't want to say he's going to end up at LSU or Bama, I mean, if he was to save himself, Bama would be one thing. But LSU's got some momentum with Brian Kelly. So we'll see how it goes. Tony, stop. Thank you for being a scoop. I'll everything for the 20. Oh, my God. Why do we have to do this? I attended the 2011 Nebraska game. I apologize. I'm sorry. Um, if you want, I'll give you Luke Fickle's Venmo and you can request some, uh, your money back for the tickets because Luke can afford it. We had a game well in hand until Brittle Braxton sprained, quote unquote, his ankle. How hurt was he? Why did we just run the ball? Even zero first downs in their basketball halftime during the game. I know Braxton was made out of porcelain. I love Braxton. He's a great kid, but he was very, very frail. Very, very soft. Um, especially his freshman year, he's very, very soft mentally. And I think that came from his parent, uh, his dad. But, you know, it is what it is. Like I said, Braxton had a, a very good career, was dynamic. He's the only reason we we won more than seven games in 2012 because Braxton was so dynamic. But uh, he did not have a very high pain tolerance. So if he had a hangnail, he was out. So Kenny got and had to be ready to go. He was... The exact opposite of JT Barrett. JT Barrett, you could saw his legs off with a rusty chainsaw, and he's still going to play in the game because JT was an absolute monstrous warrior. And again, JT, other than Troy Smith, who I love to death, is my favorite quarterback in Ohio State history, more than Fields, more than CJ Stroud, just because of the stuff that I know he played through, the level he played at when he was injured. Uh, I love JT Barrett. So I'm a big JT guy. So if you guys don't like that, then that's your fault. You can pipe off because that kid, that kid would do anything for the program. And the fact that there's fans that don't like JT Barrett and what he did, uh, it says more about them than it does him. Uh, so, but I'll, I'll get off that high horse because JT Barrett's one of my favorite players of all time. Uh, Braxton, um, I mean, I think he was sore, but I, he didn't miss any time after that. It was like we had to go with, with Joe baseball the next game. Um, you know, obviously Braxton against Purdue that same year, he like, he left the field in an ambulance on the stretcher and they took him to the Ohio state hospital and they ran every medical test that you could ever do. Like, I mean, they ran like dozens of tests on Braxton and they didn't, I remember we're sitting in the staff meeting on Sunday and they're like, coach, they didn't find a single thing wrong with him. Not an ankle sprain, not an inflammation, not swelling, Nothing. So he got his whole body scanned and there was nothing wrong with him. So again, like, is it really injury? Are you injured? Or are you hurt? What's your pain tolerance? Are you kind of a drama queen? Like Braxton was kind of a drama queen. And he probably bit that. Um, but 
Uh, why didn't we just run the ball? I have no clue. I think we were, I mean, we had, we had, we had plays. The hard part is like we called plays in the throw game where like guys were wide open. There was a player with Jake Stone was wide open in the end zone. And Joe Bowsman threw it like he was like a drunk guy at the Heine gate uh, launching a ball over <laughs> Stoneburner's head. I'm just like, what in the world are we doing? This kid, this kid was literally one year younger than me because he was, he was a junior in high school when I was a senior in high school. He went and played baseball for the Pittsburgh Pirates. So when he was in 2011, he was, you know, I was, I'd been in the NFL for three years and a GA for uh, two years. And he was one year younger. He was like 25 years old as a junior or excuse me, as a senior. And he was just absolutely atrocious. Couldn't hit the bronze out of a barn. Um, but yeah, why don't we run the ball? I, I, I just think we were trying to win the game. So we're trying to be aggressive, throw it, move the sticks. Uh, obviously, Nebraska knew that with Joe, we couldn't really throw it. So, you know, they load the box up and it seems, you know, kind of counterintuitive to run into a loaded front, but looking back at it, we probably should have. Um, but I apologize. Nevada, Tony Stop, um, who's a scoop off and also gave us 20 bucks. Appreciate you, my friend. He talks about the 2011 Nebraska game where we had a huge lead and we blew the entire thing. That's when they had... Levante, David, Rex Burkhead. Like, that's some legit dudes on that team. Um, he said we had the, the game well in hand until Brittle Braxton sprained, quote-unquote, his ankle. And he asked, how hurt was he? And why didn't we just run the ball, even with zero first downs? Uh, Nebraska would have time to win the game. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, no. I mean, obviously, as any Ohio State fan that watched that game, we all, we all remember that game. We, we all remember watching it and just watching the, you know, the run out to the big lead. And then Braxton goes down, and then every you know all all uh, all heck breaks loose, and and we uh, end up on the losing end of that one. Yeah, it was just it's a you know Braxton just had Braxton has such a mixed legacy with me, just because I mean again great kid, nice kid, uh, appreciate everybody that that comes out and sells it out for the uh, for the family and puts it on the line, but. Man, you just wish that he was a little tougher. And you know, I, I, again, I too will not get on the JT Barrett thing. But you, you guys know, I've been an undying supporter of JT's, a defender of JT's against all the barbs and arrows, just because I, I know how the kid w w was such a gamer, and you know, yeah, how how hurt he was, and how many times he came up with big plays for us and short yardage and whatever. And, Braxton was, you know, he was a, a big play waiting to happen and a, a spin move and a, you know, a little crease and he's gone, but man, you know, you couldn't depend on him. And uh, it was kind of a, a, a running joke amongst the staff and the other players in terms of what was going to be the next malady that was going to, going to fell him. And um, that's, yeah, that's, that's not the kind of the legacy that you want to have, but again, Braxton, great kid, you know, great Buckeye, but uh, I wish he was, wish he was a little tougher and wish, I wish we had to run. Yeah, I wish we had to run that ball that more that game and and came away with. But if we hadn't, maybe everything would be different. Maybe we wouldn't ended up with Urban Meyer. So I look at everything happens for a reason. So thank goodness we got Urban. Yeah, and, and the funniest thing about the Nebraska game is it was <laughs> it was like uncomfortably like comfortable. The fact that their fans that was the first time we ever played them as members of the Big Ten, 2011. They were so nice like i'm like walking out on the field and they're like reaching out to shake my hand and i'm like thank you so much for coming thank you for letting us into the big 10 i'm like i'm like girl like i'm a ga like i have nothing to do with you guys around the big 10 but you guys are awesome like i mean nebraska we had a question like who are the worst fans of the universe and i was like wisconsin penn state iowa the best fans in the entire big 10 by far the nicest Nebraska and it's like I wish Nebraska could go back to 94 95 where they were juggernauts because like I can't imagine if their fans were like that when they were that nice or when they were that good and because like Nebraska in the mid 90s they were like the Alabama the Georgia they were the team that would just beat the dog the dog trash out of everybody they went against but you know this is a a different time and era and that's the funny thing is like Kids today in modern recruiting weren't they weren't born yet. They have no idea that Nebraska used to be that dude. Nebraska used to be the Mike Tyson or the 
Floyd Mayweather of college football. And they're not that anymore. Um, and most of these guys were born in, I don't know, 2006 and are freshmen. So they don't even remember Nebraska being awesome in the mid nineties, but they were, they were amazing, but their fans were so nice. And I was just like, I hope you guys can, I hope you guys can get back on track. I hope you guys can get back to being like the old Nebraska. And that would be, that's why I always tell Ohio State fans, I'm like, look, I know that people get depressed and sad and they're sad pandas because we lose to the, we lose the cotton bowl. We lose, you know, to Michigan, whatever. And it, and that sucks. And it's not acceptable. I'm not trying to be a pudding pop, but imagine if you're like a Nebraska fan and like you're in your fifties or sixties and 30 years ago, you guys were beating the trash out of the Florida Gators by like 50 points in the national title game. You're beating, you know, they, they won back to back national titles and, they were bludgeonings when those guys played and they played in the, the national championship in uh, 2001 and like they haven't been back since. So for like 23 years, they've been totally irrelevant for the most part. But yeah, so like when Ohio State fans get salty and sad, I'm like, well, at least we're not in Nebraska. They won a couple of natties in the mid nineties when, you know, we had really good teams at Ohio State, but Nebraska would have probably beat the trash out of us in 94, 95. Um, but again, I just, uh, if you guys haven't been to a road game at Nebraska, I highly suggest going. It's a beautiful stadium. The fans are great. And it's actually a really cool venue. I've been there twice and uh, really enjoyed it. Andre Duke, thanks for being an ultra member. Thank you for the five. Kirk, Nevada, what player are you most interested in seeing this season? Kirk, I've got some coaching questions for you. I can email them to you. Make sure you email Nevada too because he's got to answer the coaching stuff. He ran... Uh, the Manhattan Beach Raiders for multiple years, and he ran zone defense, and he ran Hit box bears. in the basketball game. Yeah, he ran bears. bears. He ran box on the inbound play. So, hey, I'm telling you, if you want if you want greatness, the Manhattan Beach Raiders, the Manhattan Beach Coffee Bean, uh, Ice Whip Coffees. That's that's as good of a team as there's ever been in the Manhattan Beach area. Um, bears, <laughs> Nevada. What player are you most interested in seeing this season? If I had to pick Will Howard, that's the that's the one I'm interested in seeing the most this season. Uh, you know, we're going to go as far as our quarterback play takes us. Um, you know, you, you, we just need to have acceptable quarterback play. And we won big with JT Baird. It was not a great classic passer, not a great NFL style type of quarterback, but a great effective college quarterback. I mean, Will Howard's clearly a better passer than that. Got the size, got the toughness, likes to run the ball. Can he just distribute the ball out there and get them all in the right spots, these guys? Be opportunistic with the run. You know, we were talking about on the board today, what happens when we go four wide? And I'm like, well, what happens when you go four wide and then you have a quarterback who's, who presents a legitimate running threat to break contain and uh, and punish the defense that way with his legs? So that's, that's really what I want to see. So if I had to pick one guy... Will Howard, final answer for 2024, and, and I can't wait to see it. I mean, that's kind of the only answer is Will Howard because he's the guy that kind of drives the whole bus on the team. Because uh, we've seen everybody from last year, and I imagine we'll see incremental increases from guys like Ty Leak and Jack Sawyer, JT Tumalal. <laughs> but I, I'm going to go. I'll be full homer. The guy I want to see... It's Carson Hinsman. I think Carson Hinsman has got a lot to prove. I think Carson Hinsman has a massive chip on his shoulder. I think Carson Hinsman is the guy that was embarrassed. Last year, he was benched for Matt Jones. Matt Jones was atrocious uh, playing uh, center. He didn't know the calls. Enoch is a guy who's a great kid, but he was horrific in the bowl game, and they never hooked him. And again, there's sometimes where – you know, it's not your night. And I, I've talked about this at, at, at nauseum in sports. There's sometimes where guys don't have it. There's there's Hall of Fame guys who are top two or three goalies in the entire history of hockey. Uh, they get hooked because, you know, like, again, I always go back to the, the famous Patrick Wall. Uh, he got you know, his last game with the Montreal Canadiens. He had, like, nine goals. And, you know, the coach, Elaine Vino did not hook him, get him out of there after four or five when he clearly didn't have left him in there for nine, embarrassed him. And he famously said, I'll never play for you guys again. And they traded the Colorado Avalanche. So it's like, I, I think if a guy doesn't have it, if he's not up to speed that day, 
and you got to hook him. You got to hook him, but they didn't do that with Enoch. They left Enoch out there. He got ritually sacrificed by Missouri's D line, and you know Linky Keenels had to kind of pay the piper by getting sacked and pressured and and whatever. But I think Carson Hinsman's a guy. He's got a lot to prove. Uh, they 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 kind of lit the fire with Seth McLaughlin coming in. Um, I think Seth is a kid that uh, has upside, but he didn't have as good of a winner as, as Carson did. And again, that's not coming from Carson or anyone in his camp. It's coming from people inside the Woody Hayes that said, look, Carson's got a different look in his eye now. He was embarrassed, humiliated. Um, you know, the foundation just gave him an NIL deal because I think that uh, the coaches liked what they saw in the winter. So magically he got a, he got a little bit of paper. So I, I want to see Carson Hensman because I can't take Will Howard because I want to be a little uh, – I would give you guys a little bit of variety, but Will Howard is the obvious answer just because everything goes through the quarterback. But I think Carson Hinsman has got a lot to prove. And, you know, if he could be that true apex and run that O-line, I think we're going to be really good. So um, Carson is my uh, final answer. And Andre, please send me any questions that you have. Uh, Mr. Gray, thanks for the deuce. I need that massive T-shirt. Show me the way. Uh, you better get to repthescoop.com because our drop is closing uh, in mere hours. So please uh, get to repthescoop.com. Let me find your QR code. <coughs> but it is, uh, we, we've MailChimped it. We've put it on Twitter. We've put it all over the place. So if you guys have not got to rep the chimp, or excuse me, repthescoop.com, please uh, rep the jump chimp. on there. Rep the chimp. Rep the, know, ch uh, rep, the, rep, rep the chimp. So. The massive shirt is very, very fashionable. Um, and we added some more stuff, but I'll give you a, uh, you guys, um, rep the scoop, R-E-P-T-H-E-S-C-O-O-P.com. Uh, the link is closing tonight at midnight. So jump on there. You see the massive shirt. You see the white uh, quarter zip. You see the fashionable racer tank. You see the black quarter zip. You see our uh, hoodie. You see our cap. So, uh, Jump on there. I mean, when it closes, it closes. So um, I hope you see it, Mr. Gray. Geo did it. Uh, 42. Thank you for the 10. Appreciate you, my man. Oh, here we go. Hey, Kirk. You're not alone, my friend. I spent a lot of time defending JT Barrett on Buckeye message boards. He is an absolute warrior and one of the best leaders ever to play here. Well, I mean, like, it's hard to defend it on some message boards, especially the ones that aren't Buckeye Scoop, because... A lot of the other message boards are just filled with some of the dumbest human beings on earth. So they're not really worth your time. Uh, again, we moderate ours. It, it, it's kind of like, you know, there's there's a Four Seasons and then there's Motel 6. And, you know, we're the Four Seasons. We're nice, high-end, classy, you know, really good experience, good concierge. Like, Motel 6 is what most of the boards are. They're unmoderated, filthy, disgusting, swearing, um, that's not us. So if people are, are crapping on JT on those places, it just kind of is part for the territory because they're usually trash human beings that are doing that. So we don't really deal with that on our site because most people that we deal with are astute and intelligent. Um, Nevada, your thoughts. Geo did it said he spent a lot of time defending JT Barrett. Nobody's a bigger JT Barrett fan in the world uh, than I am other than maybe you, Nevada. But, you know, JT's a guy that I've, Talked to, I texted him last week. I saw him at one of the games this year. You know, he's doing great with the Detroit Lions as the assistant quarterbacks coach. But every time I sell JT, I'm like, look, you are a guy that I would have loved to play with. I was like, you can have one of the branches of my Buckeye tree because I know you didn't get a Buckeye tree, even though you should have. Um, he is uh, he's one of the guys I revere. He's a warrior. He's a, he's a monster. And I love that kid to death. And um, the fact that people denigrate him for th his throwing ability or whatever other stupid thing you want to do. I'm like, you know, JT won football games. It doesn't matter if he has to run the ball 50 times, throw the ball 50 times. He won a lot of games. He's a national champion, multi-year starter, started as a freshman. And people that are stupid, and I'm talking exceptionally stupid, denigrate him. So that's fine, but uh, wake me when, when one of these other quarterbacks wins the national title because JT and other people say, well, Cardell won that. And I was like, no, 
JT would have won it. I mean, JT beat Cardell out in 14 and 15. And I like Cardell, but he wasn't as good as JT was. So, uh, but I love defending GT, JT because he's such a good guy to root for, such a good kid, and such a monster on the field. But, uh, Nevada, your thoughts. Uh, have you ever spent any time defending JT Barrett on a message board, Nevada? Uh, yeah, I've spent a little bit of time. But, you know, I think it, your, your point about message boards is good. Message boards. It's just kind of a reflection of, you know, more general social media life where it, there's a certain segment of people, I, I call it the lowest common denominator, that just love to just be negative about everything, be negative about to tear down the thing. And we're just not about that. And we just don't tolerate it. And that's that's why our site is different. And it's so fun because our site moderates itself. We, we, we don't have to moderate. We don't have to delete posts. We don't have to put people on timeouts. We don't have to kick people off the site. Because when you only have good people in, it, the, the 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 bad people kind of self-select. So, look, I, I understand that, that JT, you know, people have different opinions about it. But, man, be respectful about the kid because that is a kid who put it all in line every time and won so many games. You know, I think he owned like 75 different records and, yeah, not only for Ohio State, but for the Big Ten and – yeah, the one the quarterback of the year multiple. I mean, just it did so many things. His record in big in, against top ten teams was uh, you know better than anybody's in school history. But no, I love that kid. I, we, we need more JT Barretts, and you know it, it's it's funny because when they were talking about Will Howard, they're talking about you know he he doesn't throw like a really pretty ball, but he kind of gets there. And my immediate thought was JT Barrett, and I'm like, man, I like that already. Will Howard's got a little bit of JT Barrett in him. We're gonna be just fine in 2024 and uh that, that'll be fun to watch totally agree ben g thanks for being a scoop ultra everything for the 10 kirk favorite culture change story from urban's first days at osu Ooh, Ooh. that is a juicy one how much time do we have where are we at right now we're at 51 minutes so we might be at an hour and 51 when i'm done with that one when did you realize there was a new sheriff in town Ooh, this might be two hours and 51 minutes any great recruiting stories from the insane close out to Urban's first class? Wow, Ben. I mean, he's trying to, I guess, um, juice up and supercharge the entire show. Appreciate you. Um, well, my favorite culture chain story from Urban's first days at OSU, you know, we had our initial team meeting and uh, it was the day after the Gator Bowl. So, you know, we get back from the Gator Bowl and we, yeah, we lose, and it was a weird situation because right after the Gator Bowl, um, yeah, we played that morning. So it was a noon game, East Coast time. We lose. We're done 3.30. On the plane home at 7. We land at 8.30, 9 o'clock, whatever, in Columbus. And, uh, you know, like it was, uh, it was kind of surreal because – Half the coaches went into the office and half the coaches got in their cars so they never came back to the Woody Hayes. Guys like Jim Bowman, Doc Trestle, Jim Haycock. And they they were done. Nick Siciliano, gone. They left never to return. I went into the office. I introduced myself to Ed Warner. I talked to him. I drew up who I thought should be the starting offensive line. Uh, and, and it, the guys that I wrote on the board is exactly how we started the entire season in 2012. I said, Mew Hort left tackle, Lindsley at center, Norwell, Marcus Hall, uh, right tackle. I just put a question mark. I thought it'd be Reed Fraggle, but we didn't move him yet to tackle. But I, I was like, I think Reed's going to move the tackle because he's not going to play in this offense at tight end. So that was my uh, my whole prognostication. And, you know, if Reed didn't move to tackle, if Urban for some reason to keep him at tight end, I said, put Norwell at tackle, he can do it. He's got the feet to do it. But we had a team meeting the next morning. And the next morning, it was you know, it was a 6 a.m. meeting. And, you know, we had a couple guys show up late. Andrew Norwell didn't show up to the meeting at all. And uh, it's not because, you know, Norwell was a different cat, but he wasn't a bad kid. But he took an injection in his knee so he could play in the game. We probably gave him some painkillers. He probably slept through this alarm. Again, not I'm not making an excuse, but like he played the game the day before, and you know, we were trying to medicate him so he could sleep and relax and not be in severe pain when he went to bed. So probably slept through his alarm. So but Urban obviously wasn't having that. We had like three guys that didn't show up, and uh you know, Norrell was my guy who was in the line, and 
you know, like it's hard to go up and make an excuse for a kid, but Norwell's a warrior. He's the highest paid guard in the NFL for a period. And he, uh, so then like the next day, like literally two days after the bowl game, we started doing 5.45 a.m. workouts. And we did those like seven days a week outside. Nobody's allowed in the locker room. Not allowed to wear Ohio State stuff. Um, brutal. And Urban just like crucified these kids for about three straight weeks. I want to say it was six days a week, 5.45 a.m. Uh, it's about an hour and 15, 20 minutes of just straight uh calisthenics it was like it was like PTing guys in basic training in the army uh it was up downs it was barrel rolls it was conditioning sprinting running pull-ups push-ups like you know to failure guys falling out of everything um you know we had like seven or eight guys quit like uh the Jordan Whiting quit Dalton Britt quit we had like these guys they were just running for the hills because it was so hard but I liked it because we had to get rid of some of the deadwood. We lost seven games the year before. So I told like Zach Bourne and some of these guys that were crying about how hard it was. I'm like, look, you know, whatever urban wants to do to you guys, I'm good with it. Like if urban wants to cut you, if urban wants to throw your corpse into a wood chipper, I'm fine with that because I just had to go through a seven loss season in the big 10. And I don't want to do that anymore. So if he wants to, you know, throw you in, in the back of a garbage truck and have him smash you in half, I'm good with it because whatever he did at Florida, it worked great. I was on the other side of it when they whooped us. So he's going to bring that up here. So whatever he's going to do to get to make you guys not suck, I'm fine with. So Urban obviously had his methods are much different from trust. It was a culture shock, but I was good with it. Like I wasn't scared of Urban. I wanted to learn from Urban. I've got a very high pain threshold, very high pain tolerance. Um, Urban liked me because I was literally always there like a stone golem. I was already in the, I was always in the Woody Hayes. I was always working, which is part of the reason why, honestly, I never want to go to the Woody Hayes again for the rest of my life. Cause I spent like 80 hours a week in that building for the entire season. I didn't take a spring break. I didn't take a vacation. I was in, I was in there seven days a week for the an entire year. So if I never see that building again, I'll be happy as a, a pig and turds because that's just, that's where I am in my life. But we went 12 and 0. After going six and seven, the Big Ten coaches, which are the dumbest human beings on earth, voted um, Bill O'Brien, the coach of the year in the Big Ten. Uh, it, it, and only at Ohio State can a coach take over a six and seven outfit and go 12 and 0 and not win coach of the year because the Big Ten coaches are the biggest bunch of idiotic haters in the history of mankind. Because Urban Meyer did an incredible job of turning that program around. Uh, when we were at death's door and, you know, like I said, only uh, the, the player hater ball that is the big 10 coaches would not vote him the, the coach of the year. Cause urban, all the other coaches of the big 10 hated him. Cause he shows up, he says, you guys are all lazy. You guys are all fat. You guys all can't recruit. None of you guys work hard. So urban urban said everything that the big 10 needed to hear because the SEC was dog walking us and urban was trying to get the big 10 on that level. And all these coaches are like, well, we want gentlemen's agreements and we want to be nice to each other. And we don't want to recruit guys when they're committed elsewhere. And he's like, dude, you guys are always going to lose the SEC and you guys are always going to suck because you have this soft puss mentality. And that's why I think Urban is as good of a coach as there's ever been in the Big Ten because of what he did and how he changed that culture. But uh, um, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, with uh, the second part of your question was, well, that's when I realized there was a new sheriff in town. And uh, a great recruiting story from his first close was, you know, he went after Noah Spence. He got him, flipped him from Larry Johnson and Penn State. You know, Taylor Decker was a guy that we needed badly. Uh, he got Dodson, and Dodson ended up stinking. You know, Kyle Dodson never wanted to play football. He was just a rapper, and he, you know, he was there for signing day. He wasn't there for what came after signing day. But like, flipping Taylor Decker was really good. We got Tim Hinton, we got Ed Warner from Notre Dame. Taylor was, it seemed like an obvious fit. You know, we, for whatever reason, you know, when I was a GA, I thought we should offer Taylor and uh, Greg Gillum, who was a total idiot, didn't think that we should take him. And I was like, well, he's six foot eight, and we got a bunch of guys that are six foot one in our on our roster. We might want a six foot eight guy. No, he won't come to camp. And I was like, well, you're an idiot. Um, but that's just my opinion. It's a GA. 
Uh, but Urban locked that down with his parents. And Taylor obviously has made $100 million in the NFL, first round pick, national champion. So, uh, yeah, there's my closeout. I'll get to your next question, Benji. Again, another good question. Thanks for the 20. Thanks for being a Scoop Ultra member. Kirk, what was it like in the whack when OZ gave Trust a receipt? Seems like it was an insane scene between Pryor's car and former players stabbing him in the back on TV all week after. Nevada, what do you think it, ble- it means when Ben G asks, what was it like in the WAC when OSU gave Trust a receipt? That's a good question. Well, I mean, you, you were there when, 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 he, when, he got, when he got the bullet, when, when Gordon Gee went from, I hope this guy doesn't fire me to see, see you later, Trust, and uh, when, then all the knives came out. And, um, you, you know, what, what I remember most about that whole time and this may not be a response to the question or not, but it, it's on my mind was the whole Herb street thing where Herb street. I, I just felt like a lot of ex players were kind of piling on Trussell and uh, you know, I, I never, I like Kirk Herb street and I, and I respect Kirk Herb street and his family and what he did for Iowa state and his role as a, you know, I mean, it's a wildly successful announcer, but I thought he his just his shots at, at Trussell and at the program were just gratuitous at that point in time. And I didn't, I didn't feel like he stuck up for us at all. I felt the same way about Spielman, which kind of broke my heart because Chris Spielman was my all-time favorite player growing up. And when he was talking about hash parties and all, so I'm just like, what, what are you, what are you saying, Chris? Like, where, why are we going to this right now? But uh, just a weird time. Uh, I want to go back to your earlier question about the, 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 uh, the difference between the trestle or the, the life before urban and life after urban. When, uh, when Pantone came on to uh, Ohio State, one of the first things he asked for was like the data, like the recruiting database, like where's the recruiting database? And there was like some notepad with like 30 names written on it or something like that. And that was the recruiting database at Ohio State before he got there. So uh, I, I always chuckle at that because I think about how unsophisticated we were yet how successful we were, um, but we were doing it the hardest possible way because we, we, recruiting was just something that just kind of happened. And uh, look, the idea that, that that Big Ten coaches could be asking for a gentleman's agreement to not recruit players that are already committed to another school just shows you where the Big Ten was and where the mentality of it was. Um, you, you look at that now in, in 2024 and you see how laughable a concept that was. But uh, yeah, definitely, definitely weird times. Yeah, I mean, I talked to to Pantone when he got there, and you know, I I was very much a pro SEC. Hey, we got to get aggressive in recruiting guys. Like, we got to get Facebook profiles. Like, I mean, I remember I said that in the summer of eleven, and I was like, so if we have Facebook profiles, we can contact all of these recruits, like as much as we want but if we don't because you weren't a lot of text kids so this is like the the weirdest there was a weird period of time in the early 2000s where you were not allowed to text the kids so i couldn't text taylor decker at all but i could facebook message him 600 million times and that was fine but a single text message was you know you're on uh probation uh, NCAA violation, you're getting rid of by compliance. So I was like, so what's really the difference? And then I remember I got on Facebook and Harry Heastan, who was my line coach with the Bears, was working at Tennessee, the Tennessee Volunteers. And Harry is the most unsophisticated, old, Neanderthal, tough guy, O-line coach you could ever imagine. And he had a Facebook profile. And I'm like, so if Harry has one, how many other O-line coaches in the SEC have one? So I start Googling Vanderbilt, Georgia, Alabama, like everybody. They all had Facebook profiles. And who were they friends with? All of the top you know, 25 offensive linemen in the country who I was also friends with, like Ethan Posick and some of these guys. And I'm like, guys, we should probably make Facebook profiles. I, I, I said this to Seth being as a quality control coach. Nobody idiot surf who was making coffee and whatever. I'm like, guys, like we need to make Facebook profiles. Cause like we need to recruit these kids and, Oh, well, we're not doing that. No way. We're going to do that. And I was just like, okay. 
well, I guess we'll just let the SEC like build relationships with these kids like year round and talk to them every day and ask how their school day was and ask what their test scores are and ask who they're playing that week. And we'll just talk to them when they come to camp once a year for two days and they don't even know who we are. We have no relationship with them. But that's what it was because it was, it was something where I think we were lethargic because we were so successful. Like we'd won, you know, the Rose bowl and we'd run the sugar bowl and we'd beaten Michigan and we'd done well, but like, were we really progressing or were we just feasting on how terrible the big 10 was? Like, I don't, I don't know, but the sec was just ultra progressive, ultra sophisticated. And we were like, it was like in civilization, like when there's a, a war and you've got bows and arrows, but maybe your arrow just happens to fly inside of the little thing that the tank dude drives through. The, the guy's driving the old tank and he's got like the little window that he's looking through. Maybe that arrow just happens to go right through that window and hit the guy in the head and kill him and the tank stops. But that's kind of how Ohio State was back in the day. Um, but it was it was flabbergasting, uh, to say the least. And uh, you know, what was it like in the Wackwood Trust? Uh, when OZ gave Trust uh, a receipt, I assume that means when, when he got fired. I mean, it was you know, we had like five players there. It was it was Bino, Mike Brewster, Muhort. The, and I don't know who the other two. It was like five players were there when he got fired, and it was it was devastating. I mean, it was it was heartbreaking. I've never looked at Ohio State the same ever. Uh, there was a time where I didn't really care for Ohio State because they it was like they fired my dad. Uh, and they didn't give him a chance. And frankly, the way they treated him, I thought was disgusting. But that's how Ohio State rolls. Like Ohio State, like they did it to Woody. They did it to Trust. They did it to Urban. They'll do it to Ryan Day. You know, I mean, again, Ryan, like the only thing I know about Ryan Day. And again, I like Ryan Day. I think Ryan does a great job. But it's like it's like one of those things where someone's was preordained that at some point he's going to get fired. Because we fired Woody, Earl Bruce, John Cooper, Jim Trussell, Urban Meyer. So it's like, if you want to bet odds on a futures bet, like how does Ryan roll out of here? I mean, look at what Ohio State does to coaches, but that's just my opinion. Uh, Honor defend. Thanks for the deuce. Any fun matchups to watch going on at practice? Nevada, I'll let you start, but Ty Leak and Josh Fryer has been a dominating matchup. One that everybody wants to watch. Uh, two monsters going at it and donnie jackson versus ty lake i mean our two guards are our two guards if they leave josh in at right guard that's the best guard duo in the entire nation there's nothing even close to those two um so when those two guys go against ty leak that's my matchup uh but your thoughts nevada i like the uh the davison denzel burke jordan hancock caleb downs matchups with jj smith Ameka, Innis, tate um, the, the, the wide receiver defensive back. I mean, this is a great, this is strength versus strength. This is a great group of defensive backs for Ohio state. I'm telling you, it's as good as any group that we've ever had in terms of going out and attacking the ball. They're as good as any group that we've ever had. And, um, this wide receiver group, we all know what we had last year. We all know what we've had in the recent past. Well, this group's better than last year's group. I don't know where that puts them on the pantheon of great wide receiver groups, but it's, uh, you know, it's special. So watching those guys go back and forth, those are matchups that are just so much fun because, again, it's strength versus strength. It's not a strength versus a weakness. It's it's not guys that need to be developed. It's like, man, first-team All-American, first-team, you know, first-round pick potential in the NFL draft versus other first-round pick potential in the NFL draft. And um, that's uh, that's one to keep an eye on for during the spring and, and into the fall. Yeah, I, I totally agree. There's a lot of good ones this uh, this year. Even uh, the Jim Knowles and uh, Chip Kelly ones, one I love to watch. On to defend again. Thank you for the deuce. What does a Burke Carton 2024 NIL deal look like? Well, um, probably seventy-five hundred to ten thousand bucks, and also uh, places I like to go. Um, the difference between me and a lot of these kids is I'm a sales guy. I like to talk to people. I like to see how I can help grow their business. I want to see an ROI for those guys. So it's a recurring revenue stream and frankly i think that uh a lot of these kids are scared i think a lot of these kids are um soft um they're mama's boys they're uh they're 
they're not hunters. They're people that just lay around and hope that people bring them something to eat. And I think that's their loss because a lot of these guys have, it's like they have uh, the master sword, but they don't know how to use it because these guys can go to a lot of businesses in Columbus and, and facilitate deals uh, even here or nationally. I think a lot of these business guys would be really impressed if they just show up and say, Hey, my name's uh, Brandon Ennis. I'd love to talk to you and see how I can help your business. I think a business pe person would be like, damn kid, you just did that. I'll give you you know, money just for the initiative and, and your drive. And, you know, most of these kids are too busy buying, uh, you know, fur coats and uh, gallery, uh, you know, um, uh, gallery hoodies and all this other stupid stuff. They do Dior shoes uh, to actually go put in that work. But like the world is their oyster. And a lot of these kids don't know it because they're soft. They've been raised soft. They're coddled. They don't know how to actually grind and work. But I would have, I would have killed the game in NIL if this was a thing when I played because I love meeting with people that I like to do business with. Like, I mean, I if it's a place I like to go, a place I get my car washed at, a place I go grocery shopping at, I want to know who's the manager. How can I meet with you? How can we do some sort of a deal? Can I do an autograph signing? How can I help drive you know, people to your business? Like, there's always a way to kind of uh, make it a two-way street. Because the problem with a lot of these guys, you know, because they're stupid and they're not business people, is they're just like, well, I just want money. Give me money, 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 money. But they don't drive any real value to businesses. And it's like, that's something that, like, I'm obsessed with. If somebody wants to give me... Um, you know, some sort of a deal or some sort of an advertisement. Like, look, I will bring people to your building. You guys will make more money than you'll give me. And you guys will be ecstatic about the deal that we did and how many people I exposed uh, to your business and how many, how much they spent and yeah, the whole nine yards. So that's the way that you get good lifelong relationships with potential sponsors, uh, potential business people you're going to be working with. And you know, I, I, like, again, I, I like to do organic deals. Like I like to work with businesses that I like if it's a, if it's Buffalo Wild Wings, which I, I, I've eaten more food at Buffalo Wild Wings than probably any human being on this earth over the last 10 years. And I just, you know, I love going there. So talk to their people. They're going to host a pregame, uh, spring game meetup show for us and see how it goes. And I know that I was like, look, my people are going to roll. They're going to come in deep. They're going to spend money. They're going to get a lot of food, drink a lot of beer, uh, mixed drinks, whatever. And you guys are going to be really happy with this partnership. So I'd have done the same thing in the NIR because again, when you're a business person, you know, you don't just hand out free money for some idiot kid who doesn't care and doesn't show up and whatever. But if there's a two way street and he has a real appreciation for what you do, you could, you guys could both do really well. So that's what it looked like for me. Um, and again, I just think that a lot of these kids are soft and, uh, malleable and they don't really know how to work. So, uh, they just lay around and hope people bring them money. But for me, it would, it would have been the absolute killing fields and I would have loved NIL. And that's why I love it. Cause like if someone's aggressive and a shark, uh, you'll kill the game. But most of these kids are, they're soft as butter. So they don't know how to do that. Uh, Buckeye Blitz. Thank you for the five. No question. Thank you all scoop fam for being here and making a special group. And thank you, Kirk Nevada for making this massive show possible. Nevada OH. I O. Nevada, you get any comments to Buckeye Blitz, who says, thank you to all the Scoop fan for being here, and making this a special group, and thank you to Kirk and Nevada uh, for making this massive show possible. Because again, we do this every night because it's fun. It's the best part of our day, and our community is absolutely monstrous and amazing. So uh, your thoughts, Nevada? Yeah, well, you know, as you mentioned earlier, you know, this is uh, this is a community, this is a family. So you've got a business that you want us to shout out. We don't want anything from you. We're not asking for we don't ask for money or anything like that. We're just we'll we'll help you out. That's what family does. We'll help you out. And in return, you know how you can help us out? Show up to Buffalo Wild Wings before the spring game and uh, get a smash burger, have a beer, and and represent. Because as Kirk said, you know, we're all about activating. Can we activate our community? Can we help each other out? Can we work together and uh, make things better? Well, that's what this is. That's that's what a real community is, and uh, you know th that's why we're glad to be here and we're glad to have you part of it. And if we can help you support your businesses in any way, we're, we're here to do it. Just let us know what we can do. Yeah, and, and again, like the, that's 
the great part about Buffalo Wild Wings is like the convenience factor. They're right at Lane and High Street. They have a beautiful location. It's got a rooftop patio. So I'm not asking you guys to go to Bali or Timbuktu or North Korea. Like, I mean, it's literally right on the way to the spring game. Stop in, bring the family, have a good time, have a couple uh, iced teas, beers, uh, Diet Cokes, whatever you guys like to drink, mixed drinks, have some food, meet the crew, introduce yourself to everybody. And I think it's going to be a smashing success and I can't wait for it. But, uh, you know, like, again, I, I just like to have uh, these good partnerships like we do at Buffalo Wild Wings right now. Uh, Donald and Karen at Rossbeck, they're swinging a scoop off from for the 20. Appreciate you, uh, both of you guys. You guys are awesome. Much love and respect, Scoop family. Kirk, stay strapped. Are you, is the Torah, is Torah staying at your house right now? Stay strapped. I love that. Uh, Nevada, thank you for your inside info. This is the best damn chat in the land. 2024 Natty belongs to Ohio State. Stay blessed. Family in Nevada. OH. I O. Donald and Karen, appreciate you guys both. You guys are awesome on the Buckeye Scoop message board. Thank you for such kind words. I will say, Strapped, our boy Tor is working uh, a little bit uh, at night sometimes. So he's on here uh, a little bit less than normal, but he's still on here. So I will say, Strapped, in Tora's honor. But I appreciate you, Donald and Karen. You guys are the absolute best. Thank you for being on here and also being on BuckeyeScoop.com. Here we go. My boy, Show of Steel Workshop. Thanks for being ultra. Thanks for the deuce. Huge shout out to the one and only SWO. Again. We live in Plug City. This is Plug City right here. This is Show of Steel Workshop's knife that he made me out of a railroad tie. So he's been working on the railroad all the live long day, hammering this knife out. It is absolutely sharp as a razor. Uh, it's a great back scratcher for me. And if somebody comes in here while I'm in the middle of my pockets in Nevada, their life will end quickly thanks to Shove. So if you guys need a really cool gift to give, uh, your spouse, your father, your father-in-law, your son. Uh, there's nothing better than a custom forged knife from Chef Seal. And if you guys have not followed his show on Facebook, follow it so he can stream it and uh, do it live. Cordero Jackson, thank you for the five. How is it that more uh, Team Up North players are not jumping ship? Would think Loveland and that cornerback would have jumped. Um, well, I think that that second portal open opening is going to be very interesting again you know their d-line coach got whacked uh for the ovi and i think that he's going to be uh you know finding another o-line coach or excuse me d-line coach after uh that is going to be interesting because they've got two really good defensive tackles will johnson is a legacy so it's a little bit more complicated because his dad played there but i think uh i think a lot of the um I think a lot of the uh, the talent that they've got is going to be uh, at at odds. Like I think that like Colson Loveland is the guy that if he came to Ohio State, um, maybe it's desirable as a guy that could hit the portal for Ohio State because our tight end room is it's not well coached and the talent really isn't there. But I think that uh, you know you had Colson Loveland, who's the best tight end in, in the country. Like they could get there uh, in a hurry. And Nevada, how is it that more that team up north players are not jumping ship uh, with the Colson Loveland and that and that Will Johnson, the cornerback, would have jumped? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I well, it's funny because I got a text from my best Michigan source, no, far and away my best Michigan source, and I will read the text to you. He said, "I anticipate some key dudes leaving scum after spring ball." That is literally what he said. And that was sent to me yesterday at 5, 10 p.m. So that is from my best Michigan source. Um, unbelievable source of, of information uh, on all things Michigan. Um, he anticipates that, which leads me to believe that, that is, that's going to happen in that second portal window. Now we'll see. We'll all find out together. But that's out there and that's that's out there from people that's out there in the agent community that's out there from people that know the michigan football program and that's that's out there from my best source on the michigan football program and that was as of yesterday at 5 10 p.m there you go there you go cordell great question appreciate you my friend don schaefer thanks for the five thank you for being a skip i'll remember as well we know the truth kirk you are the winged buffalo the buffalo wild wings commercials Yes, I am. 
I have to, uh, I have my kids screaming in the background uh, because they have nothing but cookies and ice cream for dinner thanks to their mother. So to afford those cookies and ice cream at night, I have to go dress up like a full size 5,000 pound buffalo and walk around and have the little headgear on. That's what I do every night. I'm in the commercials. When you're watching March Madness, because Buffalo Wild Wings is the official bar of March Madness, I actually am that buffalo. So that is how I feed my children and my wife, who uh, drain my pockets like no other. So I am the, uh, the scoop holder, uh, you know, master of ceremonies here on our podcast. And then as soon as I'm done and I throw this up on uh, online, I put on my full buffalo suit. And I go crawl around at each one of the Buffalo Wild Wings in the greater Columbus area. Uh, but that is very city of you, Don. I appreciate you for noticing that. Nevada, what is it going to take to get me out of the gigantic Buffalo costume that I have to wear? Not only in Columbus, but when I have to fly to Los Angeles and go into the soundstage. And they say, we need the original Buffalo to walk around. And they put me in that. What is it going to take to get me out of that suit? Yeah, I don't know if you can. You know, it's like one of those, some of those guys just kind of become the suit. And yeah, when I see that commercial, I have to admit, I do think the same thing. I'm like, man, that, that is Bart. I've, I've been out with you. So I know I've, I've been out there with the, uh, the hungry, hungry hippo and, uh, the, the raging Buffalo wild wing, uh, rhinoceros. So I, I get it, man. I see it. You guys have no idea how close that is actually to the truth. And, uh, Next time, I don't need show steelworks. I need like a tranquilizer gun next time we go out so I can like tranquilize you and drag you in a net home or something like that. I think that's uh, that's what I'm going to ask for Christmas. But yeah, you are definitely the buffalo. It's funny because I, I asked last time we went out, um, I was like, you need to call me the Spearmint Buffalo. Just so I can be in the amalgamation of both my who I am and where I want to be. Call me the Spearmint <laughs> Buffalo. And then it, it, it's, it just, it all comes to fruition. It's perfect. Asian it. Posh, AKA Doreen, AKA Scoop Ultra Member, AKA Queen of Buckeye Scoop. Thank you for the five. Love the Scoop fam. We'll be at the shot tomorrow night. NIT uh, basketball. Uh, the the uh, Jake Diebler crew. I think Doreen might have been in some of the white wine tonight. Uh, she said the Josh Diebler crew. Unless uh, maybe I said Josh Diebler, but I don't know. Doreen. Please clarify that for me. Did you mean Jake Diebler? I assume you did. Go Bucks. I listen on Spotify on Sunday. Um, we can listen on Spreaker because we actually get a little Spreaker boost if you look at on the, Spre the Spreaker app. Uh, so subscribe to our audio podcast if you guys are on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Um, I'm looking to see if Doreen can clarify what she meant, but I'd love to see that. But I, uh, I appreciate you as always, Doreen. You're the queen of the scoop. And I... Uh, Look forward to seeing you on April 13th. Bring the entire family out. Uh, Nevada, will you be watching the NIT on Sun? Or excuse me, is that is it tomorrow night? With the shot tomorrow night? Is that when they're playing? I'm not even sure. I'll definitely watch them when, whenever they're playing. I uh, also want to shout out the OSU women's hockey team. Uh, they're in the Frozen Four. They won. They, they beat Clarkson today 4-1 to one in the semis. Setting up uh, potentially, you know, the other semifinals going on right now, potentially setting up a, a final ma a rematch for them in Wisconsin on Sunday for the uh, national championship. So Coach Muzz got the uh, women's hockey team rolling, and uh, they got it done today and onto, onto the championship game. So uh, Doreen has a clarification. Ryan Day called him Josh Diebler. Doreen is literally the smartest Ohio State fan in existence. Nothing gets past her. Uh, and, and I'm not talking about just girls. I'm talking about boys or girls. Like, I put her against uh, Jack Park or whoever that old dude is. Like, I think Doreen would like would would slice his eyes out if it came to a trivia competition because she knows everything. And she listens to everything that's put out. So, Doreen, the queen, thank you so much for all you do. Thanks for always being on here with us. Um, so, Josh Diebler it is. And I... I call him Jake, but uh, I appreciate that clarity because, like, I didn't, I didn't get the inside joke. But when you're someone like Doreen who listens to every single minute of every single press conference, nothing gets past you, and you've always got like an arsenal of jokes ready to go. So I appreciate you. Well, Nevada, let's wrap this thing up. I appreciate you, uh, my man. This was a great show. Um, your final thoughts? 
yeah, just looking forward to seeing what happens tomorrow and kind of the, uh, I guess I'll, we'll call it a scrimmage, but you know, they're going to be getting after it tomorrow and we'll, uh, we'll have a full report. We'll see what's kind of going on with uh, Ohio State football as they take the next step in spring football. Can't wait to have the report. Can't wait to be here with Scoop family talking about it. Yeah, I think it's going to be awesome, and uh, we'll have some eyes in that scrimmage tomorrow. That being said, thank you so much for kicking it with us, as always. Thank you during March Madness. Again, there's a lot of good basketball going on. So thank you for uh, tuning in, as always. If you guys enjoy this content, please give us a like. Click subscribe. Also, click that little alert bell. Uh, we've got a lot of good stuff going on. Uh, we, our meetup is on April 13th, 9 to 1130 Buffalo Wild Wings, Lane and High Street, the day of the spring game. So if you guys need tailgating plans, we've made them for you. Uh, we got, we're going to have uh, chicken wings ready to order, uh, beer, mixed drinks. It'll be a blast, full bar, full menu. It'll be an absolute uh, ball. Excited to meet a lot of you guys. It'll be fun. Uh, if you guys enjoy this, as always, uh, shout out where you guys are watching from. Shout out who you guys are watching with. Let me know what you guys enjoy this weekend for March Madness. Again, I'm really excited to see uh, uh, how the tournament shakes out. I'm excited to see how far we get into the NIT uh, under Jake Diebler. I think it's uh, an exciting NIT this year just because it's a new coach. But uh, let me know what your plans are this weekend. Again, I love seeing what you guys are up to. That being said, thank you so much, Buckeye Nation. Thank you, Scoop family. I'm going to talk to you guys tomorrow. I hope you guys have a great rest of your weekend. Go Bucks.